Thank you for joining us. Our guest today is a former Assistant Attorney General, White House Fellow and Florida State Senator. Throughout his illustrious career, he has focused upon criminal justice and consumer protection issues. And today, Dave Arenberg is the State Attorney for the 15th Judicial Circuit serving Palm Beach County. He's brought accountability and justice in areas including identity theft, Holocaust restitution, economic crimes, and even has investigated a pharmaceutical company for dubious marketing practices. Dave Arenberg will share some of this with us following these messages. You know you need CoQ10 and fish oil for your heart. You also know you need a multivitamin to maintain your health. But what you don't know is that an award-winning CoQ10, fish oil, and multivitamin are all made by Life Extension. Why settle for less than the power of science, the power of life, the power of Life Extension? At Gardens Wellness Center, we provide a full menu of holistic services under one roof. Services to heal the body through chiropractic care, acupuncture, and colon hydrotherapy, and services to heal the mind through hypnotherapy, neurolinguistic programming, and life coaching. We practice functional and Chinese medicine and offer a full herbal pharmacy. Visit us today and take charge of your health. When I was young, it seemed that life was so wonderful. A miracle. Oh, it was beautiful, magical. And then they showed me a world. Find magic again. Sprout by HP. With Intel RealSense technology inside, now you can bend the rules of creativity outside. With us now, State Attorney Dave Arenberg. It's a real pleasure, privilege, and an honor, sir. It, the pleasure is mine. Thanks for coming this way, Richard. You're reputed to be a, a relentless advocate of justice. You've been doing things way beyond what most state attorneys do. Your career just speaks for itself, but most recently involved with identity theft. Tell us about it. Well, identity theft continues to be one of the fastest growing crimes, not just in Florida, but across the country. And the big uh, part of it we're seeing these days is that people are getting their in income tax refunds stolen. By the time you apply for a refund, from the IRS, someone else has already claimed your refund, and that's becoming a growing problem. Uh, in fact, the Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder, found it happened to him. Uh, it's happened to everyone from all walks of life, even my mom. <laughs> that's when you knew it got real, when it happened to my own mother. <laughs> but uh, it's something that is, uh, anyone is susceptible to it. So we try to teach people that ways to avoid being a victim of identity theft or such as uh, file early, make sure you shred your personal documents, it's good to have a uh, check your credit reports, there's so many different ways you can help avoid becoming a victim. There are criticisms that the government doesn't react promptly enough and people who lose their identity or have their check stolen, uh, they're not assisted in a timely manner. What are your thoughts on that? I think that we're still trying to catch up with this relatively new scourge of identity theft. I know it's been around for uh, for years now, but compared to other crimes, the, we're still trying to catch up with the new technologies that's out there. The fact that the IRS scam is so prevalent is fairly new, and and yet uh, people find out how difficult it is to get their identity back, uh, that it takes months, sometimes years, because there's creditors who are still calling, uh, there's uh, d defaults out there, and it takes a long time to clear your name, and unfortunately there's no push of a button that can make it all go away. How interesting. Technology just brings in new methods of doing what humanity has always done. Yes, exactly. Unfortunate. Changing topics. You've also been very active with regard to drug laundering, chasing those who are uh, doing that, and of course, hiding terrorist assets. Could you please share with our audience a little in that regard? 
Well, in 2000 and 2001, I was a White House fellow. I, I worked in uh, two presidential administrations at the Treasury Department, and I was involved with our nation's anti-money laundering efforts. And as part of our fight against international money laundering, we looked at the laundering of terrorist assets. And, you know, this is something that uh, is, to me, perhaps the most cost-efficient, cost-effective way of fighting terrorism is cutting off their flow of funds. And if you can do that, you can stop the lifeblood that fuels terrorism by cutting off their money. And there are money laundering havens throughout the world. We know where they are, and we need to continue to get tough on them, threaten sanctions. And, and I think that is one of the best ways to combat terrorism. What seems inconceivable is that the Arab world, with the immense wealth they have, thanks to American oil technology that was brought to the Middle East, um, why is it that they even need funding from the United States? You mean the Arab world or... Terrorism. Oh, terrorism. Well, terrorism doesn't need funding from the United States. Terrorism can get their funding through growing poppy, for example, or, you know, drug trafficking, human trafficking. Uh, you see that ISIS is involved with trafficking of sex slaves. Uh, they are a criminal enterprise, and just like any other criminal enterprise, they're fueled by, they, they, ha they depend on moving their money around. They can't put their money in banks. We'll find it, we'll stop it, we'll freeze it. So instead, they find ways to transfer the illicit gains, and that money goes right into promoting terrorism around the world. But why would they want to launder money in the United States? Oh, the anti-money laundering efforts that I was involved in, that the Treasury Department continues to be involved in, it's international. The money laundering havens that I focused on were offshore. Uh, very little were in the United States. In fact, I didn't even look at them in the United States. We were, we were too busy looking at a list of countries on what was called the FATF, which is a FATF. Um, it's a, a financial task force around the world. They have a hot list of the top money laundering havens. And some of these countries you would never hear of, and I had never heard of them before I saw them on the list. Uh, and then I never heard of them again until I watched Survivor on TV, and that's where some of the people were sent, these little exotic islands that are known only for the TV show Survivor or for being a money laundering haven. Well, because of the work of the international community and the U.S. Treasury Department, we were able to help close down some of these money laundering havens, but there's some still out there. You have clearly explained that, and I appreciate that. Let's talk a little bit about other topics, such as the work you've done with regard to Holocaust survivors. Well, that was something meaningful to me as someone who, who lost uh, family in, in the Shoah. And this is something that uh, when I was a young attorney, I saw that our insurance commissioner here in Florida at the time, Bill Nelson, who's now U.S. Senator, he was investigating European insurance companies that failed to offer, uh, failed to honor policies sold to victims of the Holocaust. He and other insurance commissioners from around the country were doing this. And so I asked to be part of this investigation. And this was the largest consumer fraud in the history of the world. This dwarfed even the Swiss bank scandals. And so what we found were that there were major insurance companies, companies that are still around today, who at the time made it a business model to sell policies to Jewish families in Eastern Europe and Western Europe, all over Europe, uh, knowing that many of them wouldn't be around after World War II. They counted on the fact that they would not have to honor those policies and never pay up. And after the war, the companies didn't pay up. Uh, some claimed, well, our assets were nationalized by the communists, and others said, hey, show me a death certificate, as if, as if families were offered death certificates when their loved ones were marched into the gas chambers. The, the excuses were preposterous, and it was something that we needed to get to the bottom of, and hopefully after the... Uh, years of investigating that uh, we've been able to restore a measure of justice to the victims of the Holocaust. Still more to be done, though. What a shocking eventuality. What a terrible story all of that was. I have a question with regard to your views on perhaps the rise in crime in the United States at this time, if that is the case. Surprisingly, though, even though you see a lot of incidents on TV and it's I mean, there's no doubt that violent crime is still uh, palpable amongst us. Crime rates have gone down overall, nationally, through our state, here in our county. It, overall, crime rates continue to go down. Uh, doesn't mean we can't be vigilant. We need to be ever vigilant. 
because uh, the criminals you know, are still out there to prey upon especially the most vulnerable. Uh, and we've made a priority after going, going after habitual criminals, violent crime, gun crimes, people who prey upon seniors, children. Uh, and then we've even gone after animal abuse in this county because we think that's a precursor to uh, domestic violence and other kinds of crime. Plus, you can tell a lot about a society by how it treats its most vulnerable. Uh, and so overall, crime has dropped, but uh, we still are ever vigilant on violent crime and gun crimes and crimes against our most vulnerable. And it's been my priority in this office to focus in those areas. Thinking back to the previous question, what a sad state of affairs that is. And uh, again, changing topics, how do you see the challenges facing the United States from a judicial point of view at this time in history? From a judicial point of view, um, you know, the Supreme Court is quite divided. Many of the most important rulings are 5-4, and that's something that could change when the next president is elected. All it takes is one vote on the Supreme Court to change a lot of the things we take for granted here. You know, you talk about Roe versus Wade, uh, that's a one to two vote uh, difference on the Supreme Court, depending on what the, the specific issue is. But as far as Roe versus Wade, it's probably two votes, but other restrictions on abortion, it's one vote. One vote. So you can have a dramatic change in not just abortion rights, but you can have a, Obamacare was one vote. Uh, you have a lot of dramatic changes that could be made. A term limits, one vote. Uh, all it takes is one judge. And when people go to vote, they often don't consider the ramifications of the Supreme Court. What, what kind of justices will the next president appoint? And that has lasting impacts well beyond that president's tenure because Supreme Court justices are appointed for life. And so that's something that when you vote for president, whichever side of the aisle you're on, you need to consider what kind of Supreme Court justice will that president appoint. That's the lasting legacy. The most lasting of all the legacies of a president is his or her choice of Supreme Court. Most fascinating. What are your thoughts with regard to immigration, if I may ask? Well, in this role as state attorney, we don't uh, deal with immigration directly. Uh, directly, What we deal with is, is all the crimes committed, uh, state crimes here in Palm Beach County. Now, if we do find, so we don't have a say on immigration policy. You know, whether, you know, the, uh, the current policies or whether a wall should be built or whether, you know, families should be reunited, that's not our issue here. That's Congress and federal officials. But when someone commits a crime here, when we prosecute that person, uh, we do. We will work with ICE um, if the person is illegal. But as far as the decision to deport, that is the decision of the federal authorities. Uh, we prosecute criminals here, whether they're legal, illegal. We make sure people are held accountable for their actions here in this county. As they should be, of course. Mm -hmm. I understand conviction rates are up in this county. Yes, I'm, I'm very proud of this because when I took over a state attorney in 2012, uh, our county had the lowest conviction rate in the state of Florida. Uh, there are 20 state attorneys throughout Florida. We, uh, there are, so there's 20 circuits, and our county is so large that it's an entire circuit. So we're the 15th judicial circuit and we were dead last when it came to overall conviction rates, meaning more criminal defendants were going free in this county than any other uh, circuit in Florida. And with the great work of, of some of the folks we brought in, like Al Johnson, who has done amazing work with Sherry Collins on, tra on training, with some of the changes we made with uh, intake, which started by my predecessor, P. Antonacci, uh, and just with, I think, giving the discretion to our prosecutors to make the right decision and to do things not based on politics but based on evidence, based on facts, uh, and trusting them. Because if you don't trust your line prosecutors, you know, you know the ones on the, on, the, on the felony line, if you don't trust them to make the right decision, they shouldn't be here to begin with. But if they're here, you train them right, and then you trust them to make the right decisions. So with all this in place, we've been able to dramatically increase uh, our conviction rates from dead last to now the top half of the circuits, of all the circuits, within three years. And we're very proud of that. Uh, we're still working to improve, but uh, it's been uh, the most dramatic jump of any circuit in Florida. Yet another of your achievements. My personal view is, on this beautiful planet, I care about life personally everywhere and human rights everywhere. But this is a Jewish-oriented TV show, and my thoughts are, if I may ask, 
What are your views with regard to the challenges facing the Jewish community and its relationship with Israel at this time? Yeah, this is a very challenging time because the answers are, are not so easy right now. With the case of Iran, it's, it's just not easy. Uh, you have a, uh, a situation where I believe that regardless of where you are on this proposal, I believe that the motivation of the president is to try to ensure that Iran doesn't get a nuclear weapon. Now, whether you believe that the deal is the best way to go about it, uh, it's, it's not so cut and dry black and white uh, because there are leaders on both sides of this issue determining which is the best way to keep Iran from getting the bomb. I think that there is a clear consensus that we cannot afford a nuclear-armed Iran. The world cannot afford it, let alone Israel, the United States, the Middle East. And so then the question is, what's the best way to get there? So in the past, where it seemed to be pretty cut and dry, supporting Israel, um, standing up to uh, those who try to destroy Israel, now it's a lot more nuanced as to what the next approach is. Is it is the best approach to negotiate um, with Iran in the hopes that the mullahs and the leaders of Iran are acting in good faith? Or is it a government that clearly cannot be trusted? So these are the decisions that Congress is going to have to make. And, and it's really, it's causing a real divide within the Jewish community and members of Congress who, who normally would, would always support Israel. But now it's, it's not as a clear of an issue, which is the best way to support Israel? Is it a support the deal or not? And that's what's facing members of Congress. Quite a dilemma. So much conflict. <laughs>Israel there stands in the Middle East, surrounded in a very rough neighborhood, threatened with annihilation. And it is difficult to witness things deteriorating further and further, it seems, year after year. Well, I'm thankful that we have a state of Israel because, you know, I worked on Holocaust asset restitution. I've spoken to so many Holocaust survivors. What if uh, we had had a state of Israel back then, during the 1938? I mean, six million of our people would have never perished. It would be a safe haven for them, and that's why we need to ensure that Israel remains strong and safe. And I do know that regardless of what happens here in this country, that the state of Israel will always act to protect itself, regardless of international threats or consequences, such as when it bombed the Osirak nuclear plant in Iraq in 1980. Even President Reagan and uh, the United States supported sanctions on Israel for doing that unilateral attack. And then we found out later that that attack helped avert Iraq from getting a nuclear weapon, something that you know we wouldn't learn until later, but Israel knew at the time. So we know that no matter what happens in this country, no matter what decision is made on the Iran deal, that Israel always act in its own self-defense. I'd like you to share with our audience why you feel it is essential for neither Jew nor Gentile to forget the lessons of the Holocaust and that the atrocities perpetrated by Nazi Germany, not only against millions of Jews, but other people as well, did in fact take place? Well, you know the, the adage that those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. We have seen uh, genocides repeatedly, sadly, after the Holocaust, and we thought that would be hopefully the last one ever. And that's why I encourage everyone, no matter what your religion or your ethnicity, to visit the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. It speaks not just to the Shoah, but also to genocide against the Armenians, and, and uh, you can just, in fact, I participated in Armenian Remembrance Day recently where I said it was a genocide, and the world should be able to say it was a genocide. Even though our government has had uh, friendships with Turkey, you can't be afraid to speak out when you see wrongdoing and you see genocide, and that's something that um, I'm unafraid to do, and I think that's important for people to learn about all the different genocides. Rwanda. I mean, that was something that happened in such a short period of time, but that was genocide. It's important that we pay attention and learn those lessons because it will happen again. And unfortunately, it, it could happen well under our nose in an age of electronics and Twitter and you know everything that goes on at the same time. It's still, it's still something that could happen so quickly. Like Rwanda, it was a matter of days when so many Tutsis were, were murdered, slaughtered. And it was happening while, you know, in a relatively recent time when... People were just distracted by other things. Can't let that happen again. 
so many tragedies and it seems humanity hardly learns. This is all very interesting and I'd like to change topics yet again and ask you about drug abuse and yeah. Oxycontin and the other things you yeah. were doing to limit these crimes. Yeah. I served as the Attorney General's drug czar, which uh, made me a special prosecutor going after prescription drug trafficking here in Florida, and we had the advent of the pill mills. And we knew that when we shut down the pill mills that some of those addicts would then move to heroin because heroin and oxycodone, which were sold, oxycodone in those pill mills, they have a similar effect in your brain as each other. And so we knew that once we made it so expensive and difficult to get oxycodone, some of those people would go back to heroin. Fortunately, the decrease in oxycodone abuse has surpassed the increase in heroin abuse. And the number of deaths that we've averted, we've, the lives we've saved from oxycodone abuse, is far greater than the people who have died of heroin abuse at the same period of time. Still, any deaths, any of these deaths are, are too many. And that's why it's important for us to remain vigilant to make sure that we offer not just criminal punishments, but, but treatment and rehabilitation to get those people off of heroin so they don't keep going back oxycodone flip-flop to heroin and stay as a drug abuser. Today there's a synthetic drug called Flocka that is making people act crazy. They, they, are, they, they get naked and they run around sometimes, they attack police and it's a synthetic drug that is, is showing its greatest numbers in Broward County and that's why the state attorney in Broward County, Michael Satz, is starting a grand jury to analyze the problem further, and I give him credit for that. How very interesting. I had the privilege of interviewing Mike Satz, in fact. You investigated Purdue Pharmaceuticals. Would you like to comment on that? When I was a young assistant attorney general, I investigated Purdue Pharma, the maker of OxyContin. I did so at the behest of Attorney General Bob Butterworth, and I believe we were the first state in the country to investigate Purdue Pharma for its marketing practices because this was at the beginning of the oxycodone um, abuse when it was, uh, before it became seven deaths a day, it was just at its incipiency. And we investigated because we found that they were marketing the product like it was Advil. When in reality, it wasn't an arthritis medication. It was something that is so powerful that it really should, have, should only be used either for end-stage cancer victims or for people who are in, severe pain who can't get help anywhere else. And the way it was marketed was way too aggressive. And so we eventually settled with the company. They paid millions of dollars to the state. They changed their marketing practices. They helped fund a prescription drug monitoring database. Unfortunately, the legislature took a decade to enact that database, which has since saved so many lives. Um, so this was something at the very beginning. This was something back in 2001. And uh, it, it, it was uh, the start of, of something that in my career lasted for well over a decade. I continued this fight when I was a state senator and now as a state attorney. It is said about you that you are a rising star and will eventually be in much higher office. Would you like to comment on that? Well, I appreciate that. I'm now 44 years old, so uh, hopefully there's still some rise <laughs> left in the star. I don't know. Uh, I love this job as it is, you know, and, and, and I'm very happy here because I can do justice every day and we can, you know, you know, we really make a difference in the lives of, of the community because when I was a state senator, you know, I was a member of the minority party and you don't have a lot of power when you're in the minority in the legislature. But when you're a state attorney, you really are the, the top law enforcement officer here and as a result you can make a real positive change and stand up for victims and help keep our families and our streets safe and that's something that I love every day when I get up. As far as the future, who knows, it'd be, it'd be great to have a, a, you know, to be mentioned in categories like, you know, rising star and be able to be put in, I mean the fact that you've interviewed so many prominent individuals, I'm honored to be part of this broadcast. So what the future holds, we'll see. But right now, uh, I am running for re-election, and I'm going to, uh, you know, to hopefully stay at this job uh, a while longer. I and many of my team have great admiration for you, as Bill mentioned earlier, and I would love to see you continue with the wonderful work you're doing. In fact, I wish all the state attorneys in this country were half as dedicated as you. I want to thank you so very much for being with us Richard, today. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I'll be right back. Mm -hmm.